morning, everyone, and thank you to everyone for joining us um, here today. Just to introduce myself, I'm Louise Bridget, Director of Not For Profit, um, working in the Plymouth office and in the West region. I hope you've all managed to find somewhere cool to watch the webinar today. I know it's been uh, pretty warm, so I hope you're nice and comfortable and I've got a cool drink with you. Um, this is the second in our series of two webinars following our in-person charity seminar at Buckfast Abbey. So I know some of you will probably have joined last week, but it's great to see you. Just to confirm, the session is being recorded and the slides and the presentation will be emailed out to you after the um, webinars have taken place. So please feel free to share those with anyone who hasn't been able to attend. So just in terms of setting the scene, we know that this is a time of significant change for the sector. Um, the world we live in is changing at an ever faster pace, and we know that you'll be dealing with a lot of uncertainty and many unknowns within your organisations. So I hope today will bring you some comfort and some reassurance and undoubtedly some really useful information and some support. We just move through to the agenda. So we'll take a look at this morning's running order. So firstly, we've got Stephanie Henshaw, who'll be looking at risk registers and some practical tips and how to use them effectively for your charities. Kirsty Martin will then give us her VAT update. And then Sharon Austin and Nick Harris will then be looking in some detail at going concern and insolvency. You'll see um, on the webinar there that there's a Q&A section. If you want to put questions in there, we'd actively encourage that, please, throughout the session. Just pop them in there, and then we'll be planning to deal with those at the end of the webinar. And we'll be aiming to close as close to 10.45 as we can. So hopefully we'll have dealt with all of the sessions and dealt with the questions by then. I think that's all from me, and I'll pass over to Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Louise, and good morning, everybody. So in this session, um, I'm looking at risk registers. Um, and really, this is a trying to be a practical session. So we're focusing on what good looks like and how do you know if your risk management is working? Now, risk is a fact of life. Some risks are fairly easy to identify and manage. Others are less obvious. Um, and of course, some come out of the blue. Now, I thought I'd ignore the one that we've all experienced recently for the moment. Um, and take us back 37 years to October 1987. Who remembers Michael Fish telling us there was no need to worry about a hurricane? There was a hurricane. A hun hundreds of thousands of homes lost power. 18 people died. And it was the worst storm in England since 1703. Now, was that a failure of imagination? A failure of analysis? A lack of mitigation? It was pretty catastrophic, whichever way you look at it. From a charity perspective, um, the Charity Commission does have some very useful guidance on charities and risk management. So that's provided some of the background to the session um, that, that we're doing this morning. So let's just think um, a little bit more about risk to what. Um, if you'd like to move on. Lovely. Thank you, Ruth. Um, as per the uh, uh, the Charity Commission guidance. It's about risk to delivering the objectives of the charity. Um, what could stop you doing what you're here to do? Um, what are the risks to the people involved with your charity, whether they're the beneficiaries, the volunteers, um, or the staff who work within it? And also there's a specific duty on trustees to protect the charity assets. That's not just about the cash, but that's all your assets from um, fraud or from misdirection. Now, typically, risk falls into five broad categories. Sorry, can we just jump back a minute? I haven't finished with that side. Lovely, thank you. So we've got operational risks, for example, things around delivery, leadership, um, uh, staff, um, retention, training, recruitment, those sort of things. Um, governance risk, um, that's something we covered in our previous webinar. Um, so things like conflicts of interest and actually having a, an adequately provisioned board with people who have the skill set to do what's required. Financial risks, fairly obviously, for example, dependence on a single source of income. Um, external risks um, could be things like a reputation, could be risks posed by government. Even a general election within the next week is potentially um, giving rise to risk for some charities in terms of a lack of clarity over what the landscape might look like. And then we've got our compliance risks around fundraising or safeguarding. 
So a board needs a response to all of those. And part of what drives your response is your appetite for risk. So it's actually quite instructive to consider how the board feels about risk um, and how that drives the way that you react. Now, what does a good risk register look like? Well, first of all, there are no awards for having the longest risk register. And if your charity has simple operations, if you do one thing with a small group of, of um, beneficiaries or, or um, target partners, um, actually your risk register might be quite short. You might only have half a dozen risks on it. It might be a page long. And um, so the important thing is it's proportionate. It needs to be fit for purpose and it needs to be easy to use. Um, so again, in an attempt to keep your risk register down to two pages, um, that's no use if you're using a tiny point size. So the uh, board will need a magnifying glass to read it. Um, it's really important to get the balance right in terms of whose risk register we're talking about. So the board are responsible for the strategic aspects of the charity management are responsible for the operational risks and it's quite a good idea to have a separate risk register for those operational things because they can get really detailed and if you try and put everything on one register it becomes completely unmanageable you can't see the wood for the trees now there will be circumstances where um, a an operating risk could become strategic so, for example, the consequences of, let's say, a serious safeguarding breach might have an impact on the charity's reputation, on its regulatory compliance, on its funding, in its sustainability. So operational risks which could have strategic consequences need to be picked up on the trustees register. But things that are purely day to day um, should sit on the on the management register. Um, common issues, having too many risks having risks that are um, operational. If you've got too many risks, if you've got lots of risks on your risk register, um, try grouping them together under one of the five headings I mentioned earlier. What you might have is several risks that effectively all have the same underlying cause. They're symptoms or consequences of the same basic issue. So try and get underneath to that underlying issue and identify that as a risk rather than um, getting distracted by, by the consequences of it. Um, people like to score their risks. I think the, the tip I give you there is don't get hung up on your scoring. There is no right way to do it. What's important is you use a method that works for you as a trustee board. Be consistent in how you score your risks. So keep a note. So if you want to have a maximum risk of five, or you want to have a maximum risk of 10 or 20, it's entirely up to you. Um, don't feel that that's wrong because it's different from somebody else. What is important is that you look at both the likelihood of a risk occurring and its magnitude, um, the impact it would have on your charity. And you multiply those two things together to get your raw risk score. So um, if, you're, if your top score for, for a risk is, let's say, four, um, then you might have um, 16 as your top raw score, or it might be 25, depending on, on, on whether you're using five instead. If both likelihood and magnitude are, are high, then you're going to have a high risk. But it's important not to lose sight of the fact that you might have something where the likelihood is very low, but the magnitude is ca catastrophic. And if we don't consider those sort of risks, those can really cause us a problem. Who had pandemic on their risk register back in 2019 or even early 2020? But of course, that had a really significant um, impact on a lot of charities. Then you need to think about your mitigations against that raw risk score. Um, and broadly, your mitigations will fall into one of four categories. So tolerate. Um, if the risk is low enough, um, you might not actually want to do very much more with it. You might be happy to accept it as it is. Treat um, effectively means putting controls or actions in place to reduce the risk further. Transfer is where you outsource or maybe insure against risk. 
So transfer might, in, might cover part of your uh, risk of cyber attack um, by getting some insurance against it. And then terminate, um, well, that's stop doing the thing which gives rise to the risk. Um, not always an easy one to adopt, but those four T's are quite helpful for categorising your response. Um, once you've looked at those, you can then compare your residual score after your mitigations with your target risk. And that target risk, your desired score, again, is going to be driven by your risk appetite. Um, now, a couple of other practical things. There's always a cost benefit payoff here, so you're never going to fully mitigate a risk. The point about scoring is it helps you prioritise where you need to put your resources to mitigate risks. So if you start to think about what your risk appetite is, you can think about where you spend the time. Um, you can also look at your residual scores individually and in aggregate and say, well, if we look at them in aggregate, is that still acceptable to the board? Is there anything else we need to do? So if we have a, a look at a, a simple example, governance risk. Your governance risk might be not being able to attract tr trustees with the appropriate skills. So what could your mitigations be? Well, that might include actually having a formal succession plan so that you know when trustees are stepping down. A skills audit, so you know what skills you would lose when those people end their term of office. And also where you've got real gaps at the moment, skills you need and don't have. Having a recruitment process, which is at least in outline terms, set in advance. Do you go for a formal recruitment process or is the size of your charity and the, the nature of what you do such that an informal process would work? But you really need to be clear on that, what that is. How do you induct your trustees so they understand the charity and what you're trying to achieve and what their duties are? Um, and then how do you deal with your ongoing training and development? So those are some suggestions for what might be in your mitigations. Um, the other thing is identify a risk owner. Whose job is it to make sure these things happen? So in the case of a governance risk, you might have um, either an individual trustee who takes that on, or you might have a subset who act as a sort of nominations committee who will then oversee this process. So moving on again, let's think about maintaining and using your risk register. Um, you put lots of effort into creating it. You don't want to just dust it off annually. Um, so tips, again, visual keys so you can identify what are the key issues are really helpful. So RAG ratings, red, amber and green, colour in your risk scores, both raw and residual, in order to identify just at a glance where your big problems are. Maybe have some extra columns on the end to track movement in risk scores because you should review your risk register periodically. Um, and if you think the risk has changed and in either increased or decreased, it's useful to use some arrows to show that. Then again, it's very easy at a glance to see exactly what's going on and where the potential problems might be. Um, think about how often you want to update it. And um, that depends on the complexity and speed of change in your charity or the environment you work in. Um, three or four times a year is not a bad idea. What you don't want is that your risk management takes over all your meetings, creates lots of subcommittees. The objective of your charity is to fulfil your charity objectives, not to be managing risk as an activity in its own right. You know, that's there to help you. It's not there to be the raison d'etre of what you do in your meetings. Quite a good tip is think about the implications at the end of each board meeting for the discussions you've had. Are there any new risks you've identified? Um, you might not add them to the risk register right away, but you could log them so that the next time you do a review, they get picked up. Um, remove risks that are no longer a strategic threat. Some charities like to have an extra tab on their risk register for retired risks. So they haven't gone completely. They know that they were there, but they're not on the page that everybody's looking at. Um, Meeting discipline, as I said, to stand back, think about whether there are any risk implications. Now, management can be really helpful. They may prepare recommendations on the risk register for the board meeting. They may give an indication of where they think things have changed, but it's still the board's responsibility. So board needs to challenge the inclusion or exclusion, change or lack of change in risks. And that means trustees have got to do their own homework. 
they've got to do their own thinking. So think about how you provide your trustees with the ability to do that. What training do they get on risk management, but also what, what education do they get on the wider charity landscape risks? Now, again, maintaining your risk register and using it, other things to think about. Um, the first one here I think is really powerful and, and it often gets overlooked. So how does your risk register link to your trustees report? Now, the obvious one is that you have to talk about your principal risks and uncertainties in your trustees report. So the principal risks you talk about there ought to be the big ticket risks on your risk register. And the mitigations you talk about should be the ones that you've identified as a charity. This shouldn't be a completely separate exercise that you create just for the financial statements. Also, use your risk register to inform your reserves policy. Um, and we'll come back to this in a moment, but, but broadly what I'm getting at here is when you're thinking about what reserves you need, think about the financial implications of those um, remaining risks. What are the consequences? Um, other useful things to do, as I said, think about your overall risk appetite. When did you last discuss how the trustees and management feel about risk? in the charity? What are you prepared to accept and what are you not, to prepare, not prepared to accept? So if you're developing a new strategic plan, where does your risk appetite reflect in that? When did you last talk about this? Um, and when I say risk appetite, broadly, I'm talking about four categories. Are you averse to risk? Um, and that might, for example, be very true of any regulatory risk, particularly if you're in a care type environment where we're safeguarding um, and dealing with um, expectations of let's say CQC would be paramount. You wouldn't want to have any failings there, any medical risk. So you might be averse to risk there. You might be cautious about risks in other areas or you might even be open to risk. That would be the sort of third level. Um, the final one is positive. We're willing to accept some risk. If your charity is trying to innovate, for example, in how you deliver some services or how you raise funds, then actually that's going to be difficult if the trustee mindset is to be averse to any form of risk. Um, finally, what you'll see on the slide there is a heat map. These, again, are a very useful tool, as well as having your risk register with the scores, a heat map that shows where your risks land can give you a good and quick visual um, sense of whether your risks are causing you a problem. So you can see here there are quite a few clustered in the top right hand corner, which would suggest that there might be quite a bit going on in the charity. But if all your risks were clustering down in the, in the bottom left hand corner, as a trustee board, you might ask yourselves, are we being as ambitious as we could be as a charity? Are we allowing our aversion to risk to actually straitjacket what we can achieve? Moving on again, how do you know your risk mitigations are working? Um, you need to know as a board. So this is about sources of assurance. Now, some of your assurance will come from management via the reports they give you, perhaps by the key performance indicators that you've asked them to report on. But it's still important that trustees challenge and look under those KPIs to make sure the data supporting them is, is solid. Um, you might look at year end adjustments. Um, are there a lot of changes to the final figures compared to what gets reported in your management accounts? Um, because that might suggest that some of your risk mitigation around finance isn't working very well. You could look at your audit process or so your external audit and the feedback you get through a management letter or an audit completion report. You may have information from other regulators. Um, you may have certification, for example, cybersecurity certification, which we do for quite a lot of our clients um, to provide the board with assurance that their cyber mitigations are, are actually doing what they ought to. Um, or it might even be getting an independent organisation to come and review with your investment committee how your fund managers are doing. And our financial planning team will do that for a number of charities. Um, other things you can do, the trustees can do their own deep dives. Go and talk to staff outside senior management, the people who are actually delivering on the ground. What do they tell you? 
triangulate different sources of evidence to look for inconsistencies and see whether actually everything stacks up or you're getting different messages. So, you know, have a look for unexpected things. You've been told that the, the regulatory side of things is good, but then there have been reports to the information commissioner or you've had to do a serious incident report. Well, what's that telling you about the part of your charity where that problem arose? Stress test, the combination of risks. Now, this is really useful for formulating reserve policies. What would be the impact on your forecasts if two or three of your risks all hit at the same time? What's the financial consequence of that? And how well would the charity stand up to that threat? Um, how do you document all of this? Well, you can either add the assurance to your risk register, so yet another column, or actually it's sometimes helpful to have a separate assurance map. And the ICAW have quite a good example of this, um, which you can get to through the link on the slide. So just very quickly, some examples of assurance. Um, if you're a grant making trust, your assurance might come through looking at the due diligence that's done before you make grant offers, asking to see the follow up reports during and end the of the project process so you can see what's being done, are the funds being applied as you intended them to. Um, if it's fundraising income that you've regarded as a risk, you might be looking at financial KPIs around a particular event. Did you actually raise what you expected? You might be looking at your overall target fundraising against actual. Um, and sometimes a good visual here is really helpful. So even if it's just, you know, something that looks like an hourglass or a, a thermometer, which color colors in how far you've got towards your target. Um, numbers aren't necessarily the best way to communicate. You might look at um, attendee numbers, feedback from participants, staff turnover. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that could, could appear in there. And around your safeguarding, um, concerns, which might be operational, but of strategic importance. Um, what are you being told when you triage the policies and procedures in place? Maybe KPIs, things about whistleblowing or um, volunteers. Um, what, what are you seeing in terms of sickness or absence figures or behavioural issues? Have you got evidence of people having completed their training? So you can look at all of those things together. So finally, how do you check all this works? Well, I would say you can sum all of this up in six points. The first thing is your risk register should be proportionate to your charity. There isn't a right answer in terms of the size, length or content of your risk register. Secondly, it needs a strategic focus. So be careful not to get bogged down in operational detail because you're treading on management's toes and you leave that, need to leave that to them. It needs to be actively maintained, so you need to be using it, looking at it regularly. You do need ensure assurance that it's working, so you need to think about how you're going to get that. I would recommend as point five that you use it to inform your reserves policy, your decisions in that area. Finally, it should reflect your appetite for risk making sure you're getting the balance right between protecting your beneficiaries and your funds and your assets and actually being able to provide the services that you need to provide. I hope that's been useful. Um, I think we're now moving on to talk about VAT. Hello everyone. Right, so today we're going to cover, if uh, we can go to the next slide, we're going to cover um, the following. We're going to go through some fat updates that are particularly pertinent to not-for-profits. We're going to look at HMRC inquiries. In particular, we're going to look at the current landscape at the moment, um, ways you can mitigate risk, and key and really important, how to communicate with HMRC in the landscape we're in at the moment. So first off, uh, the VAT updates. Uh, not-for-profit sometimes doesn't get a huge amount of assistance in the VAT area. Um, at the moment, we've got the proposed consultation that the Tax Administration announced in April. Um, and they're looking at various ways of doing VAT reliefs for businesses that donate low value goods to charities to give away freely. The main reason for this is to reduce the VAT cost on those businesses because gifts of over £50 value per year per 
charity would be um, liable to VAT. So when the consultation occurs, depending on when it occurs just because of the election, that is what we anticipate seeing. Unfortunately, it's low value items, so it's things like blankets and toothbrushes. So it's it's not large items, but every bit helps. Um, secondly, the VAT registration threshold increased to 90,000 pounds this year, which was quite a big jump up, but it hadn't had any increase for some time. This might help some not-for-profit entities that don't want to register because their taxable turnover would have been hitting those points, so it may help some of you. Um, we don't see any likelihood of an increase again for some time because of the fact that Northern Ireland has to tie in with the EU VAT registration thresholds, um, and that's kind of at their max now. Um, next, energy saving materials VAT relief. Some of you may remember this, it came in originally in 2013. Um, and then it was taken away again, but it's been reintroduced and expanded further. So any relevant charitable building, purpose building, can have um, energy saving materials zero rated by the contractor if they meet the relevant charitable purpose um, requirements. Um, that's been expanded to not just covering things like solar panels, but also covering things like wood fueled burners, boilers. Um, so quite useful, but make sure you check your facts before you do any claiming on that um, further general election this is quite interesting because we all don't know what's going to occur every party's got slightly different uh, suggestions for how they might change that i think the liberal democrats mentioned in their manifesto something about toothbrushes for children being zero rated um, the labor party have got quite a few changes the biggest one at the moment is looking at the independent school fees so the intention is that they're going to make them taxable at the standard rate which is a big impact for independent schools they will have a great fat recovery that they didn't have before because of this but it's going to be quite tricky to change the legislation because um it's quite there's like lots of things to think about but one of the things they are said and stated clearly is that the educational health care plans will still be exempt so independent schools will still have some exempt income if it goes ahead it's really key to have a look at that now, what, whatever happens. Um, and on the next slide, we'll go into a bit more because actually the Labour Party have also mentioned about this. So the tax gap is a theoretical tax calculation to work out how much VAT and taxes we're supposed to be getting in. And lots of reasons um, that these things impact mean that actually whether it's insolvency or people not getting it quite right means that we don't always collect the right amount of tax. It's a big figure and it doesn't matter which government want it um, get in, but they all want to reduce the tax gap because of public sector spending and borrowing. Uh, the Labour Party have actually particularly put that they want to reduce the tax gap and they're intending to recruit 5,000 extra compliance officers to do so. So with this in mind, the compliance activities are going to increase. Um, and if we go on to the next slide. I can talk you through what that actually means in practice. So we've already seen uh, lots of more compliance checks going on in sectors we weren't expecting them, um, independent schools, all sorts. Um, but this is going to increase further with whoever gets into power because of needing to reduce that tax gap and get more money in. So the way they're doing this now is in a way more scattergun approach, which is to send out nudge letters which randomly try and get people to work out their own tax due and confess up to any issues project-based inquiries which was used to be quite sector-based so things like taxi firms or manufacturing it would be project-based but we think that's going to go much wider now because of the data-driven approach and the data-driven approach i will go through in more detail in a minute but along with side with all this scattergun approach of doing large volume inquiries and large volume letters going out, we've also got the issue with um, case workers and their limited experience and training, unfortunately. Uh, the plan was to reduce the HMRC costs by reducing offices and reducing case workers over the last number of years. And because of that, there is um, less experienced officers and they've got much less resources, which we all know about because we've all seen things in the news about complaints being up and everything it's just resources training when i did that years ago when i worked for hmrc it took um, a year now it takes about four to six weeks it's just 
a different mindset because it's all about you self-policing your tax now. So with this, there's a little bit of a lack of engagement because they haven't got resources to open and answer the phones and everything. So it's just a very difficult time for HMRC and for businesses. So it's a bit of a perfect storm. What does that mean? It means that they're going to use HMRC Connect, which is their data driven thing, to try and get more money in by hitting you more with more random questions. And the way they're going to do that is by all their resources, which are from Google, um, Google Pay, Land Registry, Border Force, Airbnb, everywhere, banks, the Land Registry, everything. They've got sources of data coming from everywhere. It come, all comes into one central point. And then they compare it to the taxpayer data and they say, oh, that doesn't match. And then they're going to come out and ask questions. And those questions might actually be quite valid, but it's a lot of time costs for you to fix. And alongside that is the fact that it's all going to be generated AI for risk assessment inquiry. So it's very random. The local knowledge where you used to have a local office that used to know everything and know what was happening or even dare I say it, the charities team, there's not so many people there anymore. It's it's just a different nature, a different um, way of being dealt with by HMRC. Um, we just have to accept that it's going to cost more to deal with it. Next slide, please, Ruth. So how does that impact on the VAT in particular? Well, in January this year, there was a, a change that meant that the discretion that officers had to not charge interest on any assessments or any error corrections that you submitted went away. This is because um, they standardised the late filing and late payment penalties um, instead of default surcharges. So it tied in with the rest of the taxes to make it all standard across the board. But with that was the introduction of interest that what used to be they used to mitigate it generally. The big impact of this is that obviously the interest rate at the moment, for example, if you make an error um, in HMRC's favour, is 7.5% on top. If the favour assess the errors in your favour, you may get 4.25% interest, but not guaranteed if they don't think the error was um, shouldn't have been spotted kind of thing. So you can see already the interest on these errors is going to really pop up if you don't get it right first time. As we mentioned, changes in HMRC staff, changes in approach with this more standardised scattergun approach. They're expecting you to come to them with the argument, so you'll get these random nudge letters or inquiry letters out, and they'll expect you to keep coming back with the information, the answers. You send them everything, you answer the questions, you tell them what your VAT liabilities are, um, and you explain why they are. I've seen lots of this with visits now. They basically ask you to do their job. It's a very different type of approach. Along with that is the tendency for things to um, not be so much negotiation, goes quite often to independent reviews who often uphold the reviews and based on just the information they have there, they don't they don't have the so much powers to go back to the decision maker and ask them to relook at it. So there's a tendency for it to go to tribunal. Tribunal is very costly. It's um, 15,000 pounds generally just for a council for the day. The whole process, putting in appeal can cost at least two and a half to five thousand pounds. The good news is if you go to appeal you can get alternative dispute resolution but it's quite a long way down the line and it's quite an expensive process just to get to talk to someone and, and sit down at a table or be at a team's table to sort of negotiate. So it's a complete change in approach, it's all pushing everything up the line for you to keep arguing and you to go to tribunal. So we've got some examples here. So the first one is an example about maybe where an officer hasn't had the experience or maybe the time or knowledge to think about it. So this was a case where a business had bought a Land Rover. I think it was a Land Rover. It's a commercial vehicle. They recovered the VAT on it. They changed it to a car, put some windows in the back, put seats in the back. HMRC officer came along, assessed and said, no, you can't have the input VAT, raised an assessment. Long story short, they went to tribunal where the tribunal agreed with the um, business that actually it was a qualifying car, pool car, and actually they could have the VAT back. But that obviously had to go to tribunal before they could get to that stage. It's quite a costly procedure. Um, being relying on what previously occurred with visits and rulings from officers just doesn't apply anymore. You really need to be self-regulating and self-policing and being aware of changes, unfortunately. 
with Real Read, they were a um, serviced accommodation provider and for about 20 years they've been treating their income as exempt. Um, they had lots of visits, so they presumed that was all okay. A new financial director came in place. They weren't sure about it, but they decided that the previous visits meant that was fine. HMRC came out to visit. HMRC said it's taxable, raised an assessment. Real Read appealed, went all the way up to the High Court, but unfortunately, the judges decreed that actually, no, it was taxable and relying on the previous VAT visits was not a reasonable excuse. The person should have thought about it and done checks at that point. It puts it all back on them to do the measures and checks um, and quite a costly um, penalty to pay. Airline Placement Limited, um, they think they'd submitted a disclosure, but unfortunately they didn't give all the information and because they failed to give all the information in a clear manner, they had a penalty issued when they appealed the penalty. HMRC said you, um, the judges said you didn't clearly explain everything. You didn't find all the clear information. Therefore, the penalty stands. So you really need to be aware of putting all your information there clearly. Don't skip anything out. Don't dis, don't mis disclose anything. Finally, the rule Surrey NHS Foundation Trust. This is just to show that it's costly for everyone, even if you're doing good things. So they were relieved on some VAT on some equipment that was going to be used for cancer scanning. Unfortunately, HMRC officer decided that they weren't entitled to that relief. Um, it went all the way to tribunal and high court. Um, and finally, the judge agreed that the trust could have that concession. But obviously, that cost the NHS trust a lot of money just to prove a point that they were right. So what does this all mean? As I said, it's all back on you to manage. How can you deal with that? You want to avoid the, having the cost further down the line. You need to have a proactive approach to managing your tax compliance and tax risk, tying in what Stephanie said about making sure you've got maybe risk registers. You consider what maybe needs reviewing. Think about if things need some sort of health check, you can put it on your re register to go, OK, this time this is something we can tolerate, but maybe at some point we might want to look at a partial exemption or, or maybe you want to consider if our grants are correctly dealt with. It's just being mindful that you need to manage that compliance. You need to be aware of it. You can't just assume everything that's been going on is, is still the same. The status quo doesn't always apply with legislation changing and HMRC interpretations changing. Maintain good records of the transactions and the business decisions. And that means, for example, if you decide to do an option to tax or you're doing a fundraising event, keep records of why you've decided to do that. Keep records of what was your consideration about that make notes of meetings and make sure that you have everything around what's happened clearly recorded so that if it gets questioned you can argue why that you've taken reasonable measures and precautions any significant changes or big things it's always advisable to get professional advice in advance of it it's much harder to fix things especially with vat because it's a transactional tax it's a, at the moment tax much better to get advice in advance of any changes or anything big happening rather than having to fix it after it's really costly to do it afterwards um, make sure you've got clear and sufficient disclosure on your returns and your supporting um, accounting so for example with that um, one where they didn't give all the disclosure it's just making sure you put everything down you've got clear records so if you do any errors in your returns or you do any corrections it's all clearly noted don't make it blank and just you know make sure it's all clear when you submit error corrections make sure you've got really good arguments and it's all clear there um, and finally really good idea to get fee protection insurance um, it used to be around two thousand pounds if you needed our assistance to do a VAT compliance check now with the times and the way it can progress almost to a tribunal and go through much more checks it can cost at least a minimum of three and a half to five thousand just for a VAT compliance visit sometimes that's not even getting to if it goes to tribunal and then you might want extra help definitely there next slide please so key points to that you need to think about what the usual areas are covered with a VAT investigation but in particular for not-for-profit you need to be thinking about the input tax recovery whether your partial exemption calculations are correct whether you consider business non-business apportionment records have you considered if uh, the exemptions apply to your trading subsidiaries? Have you recorded all those? The charges of costs between entities. Grant, always a famous one. Grant or not a grant is actually a supply for consideration. Really need to 
think about that because that is an area they will look at look at the VAT reliefs you might have obtained for non-business activities to make sure that's dealt with correctly HMRC are always going to do an accounts reconciliation it's one of their first things they do they will compare the annual accounts to the VAT returns look for any income that's not been recorded anywhere on the returns and they'll also look there for any new income streams or changes that's occurred to make sure they can spot any areas where there might be errors straight away look at your debtors, debtors and credits over six months that's just a standard check they do to make sure you've dealt with those properly and be aware that anywhere that's a gray area it's now going to be targeted by HMRC and for not-for-profits particularly grant income partial exemption non-business are, are really going to be areas they look at so how can we help you need to, oh there should be a little dot can we just spin them all up please Ruth so communicating with HMRC um, you need to be proactive and make sure you've got all the information you need to make sure you communicate with them in a timely manner and you need to make sure that you're reasonable with them and disclose everything you may need to get extra help um, from an expert some, whether it be counsellor or or us some sort of advisor to do the extra bit because often for example we've got extra contacts at HMRC we've got other people we can discuss with and talk to to try and sort things out make sure you're helpful and make sure you disclose all the facts next slide please Thanks. so here's some examples of where we've um, assisted clients um, on cases so the first one is a 50,000 input VAT claim that a client put in HMRC rejected it and said that it was not valid uh, we used contacts we had at HMRC for similar cases to prove our argument and get them to review it and um, with that and with the negotiation to agree a minor £2,000 output VAT they approved the claim and the client got the money back but that took knowledge and experience and, and people contacts to do so um, £230,000 was overclaimed by a VAT by a, VAT by a client the client submitted an error correction we spotted that they hadn't raised the assessment for the correction on time it was out of time failing the one-year rule we argued that and put a clear argument to it but they wouldn't accept it so we had to go all the way to tribunal but in going to tribunal when it got to try before it got to tribunal the um, litigator and HMRC discussed matters and HMRC withdrew the assessment so don't assume that you're going to lose it's always worth pushing it when you know you're in the right next slide please so what does that mean in summary it means be mindful that there is going to be a significant increase in compliance activity and it could come in any form be really aware that they really are taking much longer to deal with if you've got a, an inspection it's just a lot of back and forth even if there's nothing much to look at there's a lot of questions back and forth and asking for more records and it's all done mainly by email it's really laborious and then obviously if there is a question where it becomes challenging it can really be quite costly and it can be really time consuming and difficult to deal with you might need extra help so prevention is better it's better than having to come and get our help after the fact um, really need to be aware of the tax risk management and you really need to be thinking about those risks that you're considering them before HMRC come out to speak to you because the police self-policing unfortunately is on you now thank you Thanks, Kirsty. Um, so, warning everybody, um, Nick and I are now going to do a, a double headed uh, session. I'm trying to draw a thread from uh, the charity's reserves policy through to your going concern assessment um, and then on to what to do and some practical advice if things are, are looking um, sticky in terms of your financial position as a charity. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, today, uh, partly because in a, a series of uh, sessions themed around uh, trustees' responsibility and risk management, um, reserves and going concern, uh, looking after the solvency of your charity is one of the key trustee responsibilities, um, but also because we are having more conversations with our not-for-profit clients around this area um, at the moment partly a result of, of sort of some of the financial tightening that's that's been going on and sometimes just the result of sort of some significant changes in 
in sectors that, that uh, charities or not-for-profits are, are operating in. So we're going to start um, by looking at charity reserves um, and what we mean by that. Um, so as, as Stephanie picked up in, in her um, really helpful session on, on looking at the risk register, the charities reserves are, are one of the ways that the trustees can mitigate um, the risks faced by the, the, the charity. As usual, there's some really helpful background information in CC19 um, about building resilience. Um, and so it's really worthwhile reading that for some background and also some helpful prompts um, and questions about thought processes as a trustee board you can go through when um, developing or refining your, your reserves uh, policy. The key thing is about building resilience. Reserves aren't designed to ensure the charity can go on and on forever. It's about giving the charity sufficient breathing space that if something does go wrong or two or three things go wrong, to take Stephanie's example, um, the board has time and sufficient financial resilience to be able to consider options and make decisions and take appropriate actions um, in an orderly and managed way because you've got that, that cushion to see you through. Just to be clear, when we talk about reserves here, we're talking about free reserves. So that excludes restricted funds. Um, and it also excludes funds that are tied up for the long term. So if you've got funds which are invested in property or other fixed assets or perhaps in other sort of long term investments, um, those are separate to this uh, discussion. These are the free reserves that are represented by cash or things that could be turned into cash um, in relatively short order um, to help you through a, a cash flow issue. So one of the conversations we often have and things we're asked is what's the right level of reserves and a typical accountant's answer is, is always it depends. Um, and it really does depend on the nature of the charity and the, the scope of your operations. So, for example, I'm chair of a, a very small um, medical research charity. So we're grant making. Um, we have no staff, we have no commitments. We have a pot of money and we fund appropriate research projects that are, that are put to us. So all our reserves policy needs to ensure is that we've got sufficient funds available to meet the funding commitments that we've made. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, if you're a charity delivering services to, to beneficiaries, um, often to vulnerable beneficiaries, and you have um, a workforce and you have property commitments, leases, um, commitments under other contracts, um, your consideration of your reserve policy will need to be much more complex and nuanced and, and require a lot more uh, thought and work to get there um, in terms of what you need to protect the charity. Um, when you've got that sort of operation, that's often where charities end up looking at reserve policies that are expressed as a number of months operating costs or similar to build in that um, resilience to keep going should things stop. But it, it should be informed by thinking of starting with the risk register and thinking about what could go wrong, what would be the implications on the finances and what do we need to protect ourselves against that. Um, a, a common theme, this isn't a one-off exercise, so you develop your, your reserves policy, but the key thing as a, as a trustee board is to make sure you then continue to monitor, monitor it, make sure the policy is still fit for purpose, um, so with regular reviews. Update it if it needs updating, so if things change, if circumstances change, you'll need to update your policy. And at least each year you'll need to include a report on your reserves in your trustees report, so you'll set out your policy and you'll also report on what your actual reserves are compared to your target or your, your policy reserves, together with any actions you're taking. If you're significantly over or under that, what actions as a board you're taking um, to get back on track. So that's kind of the building block. You start with your, your reserves. Um, that's about trying to mitigate the risk of financial failure. A second part of that, and again, something you'll look at at least annually, 
when you're approving your financial statements is the going and concern assessment um, for, you, for your charity. Um, again, the extent of work on this will, will vary depending on the, the, the scale and nature of your operations. Um, when you approve your uh, accounts now, your trustees report includes a positive statement. So that's a change. In previous years, if you go back a little while, it was always no news is good news when it came to going concerns. So if there was no concern about solvency or cash flow, um, then trustees wouldn't mention it, auditors wouldn't mention it, silence was golden. Um, that has now flipped around to the opposite. So trustees are required um, to include a statement about um, their assessment of the going concern position in their trustees report and why they believe the charity to be a going concern. And the auditors report, if your charity is audited, um, similarly includes a, a statement in the affirmative that, that, that's, um, that they concur with that conclusion. When you're undertaking that review to approve the accounts, please make sure that in your minutes of that uh, board meeting, you include suitable supporting evidence. Now, it might be a couple of sentences if the situation is very simple, but if you are in that more complex um, position, you want to make sure that you keep all your supporting evidence with that, um, with those board minutes. So that could include a budget, a cash flow forecast, your sensitivity analysis. So that's your what if you know this income stream stops or costs go up by 20% sort of sensitivity analysis and may also link into your strategic or your, your business plan. When you're when you're undertaking that going concern assessment, you're looking forward for at least 12 years, 12, 12 years, 12 months from the date you approve the accounts. So it's not from the date of the balance sheet, but 12 months forward. Um, and that's the minimum period. So if you um, look 12 months forward and everything is fine, but you know that at month 14, you're going to lose a contract that would have a really significant impact on your charity. You can't ignore that just because it's outside the 12 month window. You need to extend your review to consider what actions you'll take and what the implications um, would be. Your interaction with your accountants will be different on this in this area, depending on whether you're subject to audit or just uh, if you're a smaller charity, if it's an independent examination. So as I mentioned, an auditor has to um, review the board's assessment of going concern, uh, test it, corroborate it to other evidence and include a positive statement in their own audit report on the going concern assessment. The requirements are much less for an independent examination, so the independent examiner does not have to report specifically on going concern, but it doesn't mean they don't take um, any interest. So the, the position there is if they have particular concerns that they don't think have been addressed, they need to think about reporting directly to the Charity Commission and they can think about potentially modifying their own report. But it's a different level of work, so you'll experience a different level of request for information. And something that trustees sometimes worry about is, you know, how am I supposed to know what's coming in the next 12 months, given the volatility and uncertainty? You know, who's going to hold me to, to what sort of standards? You're not expected to be Mystic Meg. Um, it's not uh, reasonable to expect a trustee board to be able to predict with certainty what's going to happen. Um, but the um, key message is to make sure that you are undertaking a proper, sensible, reasonable review with supporting information and making sure that the projections that have been prepared are done on reasonable assumptions. And anything in your board minutes to demonstrate that trustees have challenged those assumptions um, and had a, a proper discussion around them will be really helpful. But what happens if your undertake that review or at another time I'll review your position and things look a bit sticky. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nick now to talk you through um, the actions you should take. So um, good morning everybody and thank you for having me in your session. Um, I had a, a good chat with Louise and Sharon about um, kind of what my, my session should uh, be for and um, being an insolvency practitioner um, 
I've come across quite a lot of not-for-profit organisations in the past who've, who've come into these sticky situations, as, as Sharon uh, mentioned, sticky is a nice word for it. Um, so I'm just going to go through some, some practical points. Um, hopefully nothing is too groundbreaking, but things that I've seen in the past that potentially people should be considering um, when that happens to their, their charity, their not-for-profit. So um, the first point on there, getting your numbers up to date. Um, I've met with trustees and directors of not-for-profits in the past, and um, these trustees and directors are looking at financial information that, that can be months, um, sometimes looking at financial statements that are eight or nine months out of date. So in order to make sensible decisions and practical decisions about your organisation and, and what you're going to do about its future, you have to have those numbers up to date. And I'm not just talking about your traditional balance sheet, profit and loss, um, your management information, but also if you're considering your future, um, those project projections um, about your cash flow and how it's going to look in the future. And something to consider with your, your cash flow is not just great, our cash flow looks great for the next 12 months, but also having that integrated um, with a balance sheet and a profit and loss account. Because if you're, you know, your cash flow looks great going forward for the next six months, 12 months, but you're incurring more creditors, you know, you're taking on deposits from people, um, and the position for them is actually looking worse, then that's something you should look at in the whole and overall. So get those numbers up to date. If you're making projections, make sure those um, assumptions are still relevant if you're making assumptions, which you, which you will be in a projection, as, as Sharon suggested, about those, those crystal ball moments when you're making projections. And the next one about taking action, um, I've seen some, some absolutely fantastic um, reviews that have been taken by trustees or independent people who've helped them to look at their position and what they should do and sometimes six nine twelve months happen before they actually speak to somebody like myself um, and in that time those great plans that have been put in place there's action points on them and sometimes those action points are uh, not very nice things potentially making a member of staff redundant or, or reorganizing your charity so potentially moving away from one income stream to another things that aren't very nice to do but, but taking those actions you kind of have to have to take a step back and make those actions for the for the right purpose for the whole charity um, and just don't ignore those issues and, and I put there speak to a professional and I put speak to a professional there because if you are concerned about your future you really should be getting advice from a business recovery um, professional or a turnaround professional and that should be somebody who's qualified so they should be really an insolvency practitioner in that scenario um, there's lots of people who portrayed to be insolvency practitioners or business recovery specialists out there in the world. Um, check the qualifications of these people. And if necessary as well, I suggest if you're in a specific um, sector that's quite specialist and especially not for profit sector, I ask for some information about work that these people have done. If you're taking advice from them, what they've done in this sector before, because it's very specialist. Um, I know Kirsty was saying get advice early, but make sure you do get advice before it's too late in those scenarios. Um, moving on, please. Um, decision making. So I've had a similar slide to this before, which has said three words on it, documentation, documentation, documentation. And I'm going to speak about potentially what can happen and what can go wrong for a not-for-profit and a charity. Um, and the reason you want to make sure that you've got good documentation about your decision making, and I've put the four kind of bullet points on there to do with the documentation, is because if things do go wrong, somebody like myself, um, as an insolvency practitioner, liquidator or administrator is going to be asking you questions about those decisions you've made in the past. So having great evidence as to why you've made that decision, attaching relevant financial information, or um, if you're talking about a particular invoice or something that's come through in a meeting that you're having with your fellow trustees, attach that. Because it's very hard to find it 12 months further down the line if you're getting asked questions by somebody like myself and you haven't got a piece of paper to hand. Make sure it's there, make sure it's documented. PDF it, stick it on an email, share it with the other trustees and just make sure you've got that information as to why you're making those vital decisions about the future of your organisation. Moving on, please. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so I couldn't be an insolvency practitioner and co cover this kind of um, original question that I get asked every time I have a meeting with, with either directors or, or trustees of an organisation and that is, is, is my charity insolvent? What, what should I do? And in the Insolvency Act, Section 123, as I put up there, there's three tests of how an organisation can be insolvent. The balance sheet test is what it says in the tin. Um, are your assets less than your liabilities? But 
also something to be aware of there is not just your liabilities on your balance sheet your prospective and contingent liabilities have to be taken account of as well so you're kind of off balance sheet liabilities your cash flow test is can you pay your debts as they fall due and if you can't um, your organization is insolvent and the legal test is um, more for the lawyers in the room but if you've had a, a stat demand issued against your organization and you can't pay it you you are legally insolvent um, if your charity is insolvent that doesn't necessarily mean we should stop and close the doors really what what it means is your change of board emphasis should change from being your traditional um, uh, board objectives which you've had in your constitution document which is whatever that charity has to do or not for profit or company is you know to promote the the, the, the organization's objectives but actually your number one objective then should be to protecting your creditors of your organization and having a strategy as to how you're going to do that and not put your creditors in a worse position by continuing moving on please so I think Sharon's going to ask me some questions now about some common misconceptions that we've discussed in the past in when dealing with clients. Um, hopefully they should maybe help some people with those things that they've come across in the past. Yeah, so I'm going to grill Nick now, put him on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, if I'm a trustee of a, an, a charity, Nick, I know um, if I'm a trustee of an unincorporated trust and I'm amazed by how many of those there are still around but i i go into that knowing that i've got potential personal liability for my actions but if i'm a trustee of a charity that's formed as a limited company or has a trustee company that's limited and i'm a director of that so i've got that limited li liability does that mean um i'm protected by that limited liability and there's no personal financial risk to me as a trustee that's, that's, a, that's a good question that gets asked, asked all the time. Um, so kind of the answer is yes and also no, because the charity, as you've rightly said, and the, the directors, the trustees are separate legal entities. And that's why you traditionally would have that incorporation and that separate separation of the two. If um, the charity does get into financial problems and go into an insolvency process, um, a liquidator or an administrator probably will get appointed. Um, somebody like myself and part of my role then as the liquidator is to look at not only getting the, the assets to pay the creditors and, and doing my best on that but also to look back retrospectively at the charity looking at what has occurred the reasons for that failure and looking back at the trustees and anybody else kind of involved and looking at if any potential financial loss has been caused to the charity by those people's decisions so we mentioned about board minutes and decisions earlier and if the organization for example has carried on for an extended period of time when they knew that they weren't going to be able to pay those creditors and they put creditors in a worse position um, I would be taking what's called a, a wrongful trading action against those directors and trustees potentially personally as well so looking for them to restore the position from when they considered that point and traded on so um, or continued on in operation so um, the answer to that unfortunately is um, a bit of yes and a bit of no. Okay. And does that extend? So if I'm a I'm badged as a non-exec director, for example, rather than a, a trustee, does that apply to me as well or am I off the hook there? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. So um non-exec directors should be taking um, active steps to know what the financial position of the of the charity is. So they should be getting themselves involved in board minutes. And certainly um, when I've done this sort of thing in the past, I want to know what the financial position is, speak to the people who are in the know, um, get myself involved. Um, and something to be aware of there as well, Sharon, is that if you're involved in the promotion, management, formation, or, or acting as what would traditionally be known as a de facto director, um, you can be personally liable for the debts of the organisation or debts that have been incurred due to your actions as well. So um, there is a very famous case about um, not just the governors of a, of a, I don't know, we're talking about independent schools, but the um, senior management, so the, the head teacher and bursar, um, because of some of the decisions they've been made in the past, um, there's actions been taken again and again against them because they're not even trustees, they're, they're not even directors, they're not non, non exec directors, they're just making decisions on behalf of the charity. So, something to be aware of there. Okay. And when I'm one thing when I'm looking at 
sort of reserves and presumably if, if if things are getting tight i one of the things i want to know as a trustee is what it would cost us you know if we have to go down the close down route what it would cost us but i have heard that the government will cover redundancy and staff wages so do we when we're doing our planning for you know worst case close down do we need to set funds aside for that or do we not need to bother yeah so the redundancy payment service part of the insolvency service at you know a, a, a government body they will step in and when a um a company a not-for-profit as an organization doesn't have the the funds to pay the employees their redundancy pay their pay in lieu of notice and um, their holiday pay and their arrears of wages if they're owed any of those amounts um up to a limit of seven limit of 700 pounds per week um, they will step in and pay those claims on behalf of the company if they don't have the funds. But obviously to do that, the charity will need to go into a formal insolvency process. So that means that they haven't got the reserves then to do that. And that means as a trustee, you will be taking or will have taken the active steps to put your um, your organisation into a liquidation or an administration or some sort of insolvency process. So kind of past that point of reserve. So if you are considering that as a way that they're going to get paid, that is only if the charity gets put into an insolvency process. It's so slightly different to what you were thinking with the reserves and what's left at the end. So, so don't count on it as a safety net for us. Exactly so right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, so something I know when I've talked to, to some of my charity clients about, about, you know, potentially having a conversation with you, nice man as you are and helpful as you are, is um, the fear that it could snowball that if they start to involve advice from an insolvency practitioner is that kicking something off that will then gather momentum and and almost lead inevitably to the the charity ceasing to to operate and, and close down what's think, your experience of that yeah so i think i think that's kind of a, a common misconception that a lot of people don't take that plunge to get advice from an insolvency practitioner in, in any kind of sector of life because they feel once that you know, without being kind of too brutal about it, once I've got my hands inside the door, I'm going to be closing the place, which is completely opposite to what my role is. So my role is to speak to the trustees in that scenario, understand what's going on, um, give them the advice on the options and potentially what potential personal liability there could be for trustees in that scenario. Um, and then them to consider that, have a free initial meeting. Our, our initial meetings are always free with everybody, that free initial hour consultation to, to talk about options. Um, and kind of something to be aware of there as well, Sharon, is that um, 70 to 75% of those initial meetings I have with people, it's great to have the meeting, but 70 to 75% of people don't ever see me again. They go away, they, they listen to what's been said and they move away and um, maybe make some changes and, and, you know, move away and things turn around. So it's something to be aware of there as well. So, so don't, I think as Kirsty mentioned on her sex, section, you know, do get advice in these scenarios if you are concerned. Okay. And just, just finally, so if I do end up as a trustee of a charity that ends up, for whatever reason, going through an, a formal insolvency process, does that have any implications on other trusteeships I might have, or maybe if in my day job I'm a director of a another limited company, do, does it have any crossover impact? Yeah, so as well as I, I mentioned all the all the jobs of a liquidator earlier, so if your organisation does go into a insolvency process, um, as part of doing all of that other stuff, I do, I do have to do a statutory report to the insolvency service, the, the DBIV, about those people who have been directors and trustees of the organisation um, complete this form. Um, it's not as exciting as it used to be, but it's a form about what's happened to the charity um, and who the directors were, what they knew, what they are aware of at the time. And if the insolvency service do want to take it further, and, and there are not um, substantial amounts at the time they do, but they do in some scenarios where they aren't particularly, you know, or they are concerned about what's happened, um, there is the potential risk of being disqualified as a director for between two to 15 years. Um, so there is that risk there um, and something to be kind of mindful of in, if you do have other directorships and trusteeships, as well as potentially the, the one that you're talking about. Okay, thanks. So I think Nick and I would both say 
the the purpose of our, our uh, chat today was, was not in intended to terrify people or put people off being trustees, but just making sure that people are aware of, of the responsibilities that they are taking on and just to make sure it's very easy and I, you know I came away from from our earlier seminar or in person one went back to the charity I'm a, a, a trustee of and went mm, we're not actually documenting our review of our risk register and so it's, it's really helpful just to have those reminders um, about the things that we we should be doing and documenting and making sure that we lift our heads and, and take advice at an early stage if we have concerns. Thank you, Sharon, and um, a huge thank you to all of our uh, all of our speakers this morning. There's a wealth of information there, and as Sharon just alluded to, I think even us as presenters and, and experts, we've still got things that we've managed to take away and can use with boards that we work with and clients. So. Um, very happy to take some questions now. We've got a couple there that have just come through on the Q&A. So if I just take the first one, which Kirsty, I think is for you. So not-for-profits dealing with clinical support are not always fattable. Are there any changes expected? Well, I was about to say, it depends what you mean by clinical support, because it's not necessarily all exempt either. But um, there's no changes at the moment, but a lot of people are suggesting and inferring that if People are looking to make education exemptions no longer exempt. Are they going to move into healthcare and other areas? But I would just say, don't assume because you're doing anything to do with clinical that it's going to be exempt either. And then, Nick, I think this one's for you. So if I seek to be a trustee, am I still liable for past actions? Yeah, good, good question. That does, um, does come up a lot and could have been something that Sharon and I thought about putting in our section, actually. So... Um, the answer, I'm afraid, is, is yes. So those that time that you've been a trustee of an organisation and your decisions when you were the trustee, um, yes, if, if in the future that um, not-for-profit or, or charity or, or whatever the, the organisation does go into an insolvency process and you've taken actions that have caused the loss to creditors, then yes, potentially you are. There are some statutory time limits. I won't go to them in detail, but there is one part of the Insolvency Act that goes on and um, can go back forever to look for things that have happened. So I'm not saying you're you're forever off the hook, but there are most of the actions are probably two to five years. Um, but yes, you are potentially still liable for, for things that you've done in the past. Thanks, Nick. So those are all the questions that have come through on the Q&A. Obviously, it goes without saying that we're all around, um, hopefully you can find us quite easily or speak to your contacts within Francis Clark. And if you've got any questions, for any of our sector experts here or for anyone within the firm please ask away particularly when you've shared this and shared the information that hopefully you've learned this morning with your boards and your your colleagues other things may come up just a quick reminder just to say that as i said at the beginning the session has been recorded those will be distributed so please feel free to share those and really just to thank you all for attending and um, hope you have a good day thanks very much <laughs>